Hi, my name is Guy Wallace, and in this pack video short, we're going to cover performance model charts and the data that's captured to align to the areas of performance, one of the analysis methodologies of the pack processes for training and development, learning, and knowledge management. PAC is an acronym performance based, accelerated, customer and stakeholder driven training and development of any blend. Another aspect of analysis, once the areas of performance, the AOPs are established, is to gather the more granular data and I do that on a device that I call the performance model chart. I've been using a chart like this since the late 70s and it has changed over time but basically for each area of performance I'm going to identify what are the outputs produced when you're doing analysis or design what are the deliverables from that and there may be terminal final deliverables and there may be deliverables that are more interim before that and so the goal within the box of the area of performance is to identify all of the key outputs or all of the outputs whether they're key or not. That's a decision that has to be made. For each of those outputs then I want to know how do you know a good one from a bad one? How do you measure them? You can use quality, quantity, cost, and mechanisms like that. And again, use things that are familiar to your client world, not from our instructional world, but use the things that they use that are the authentic measures. Now, there may not be formal measures in place, but if you've assembled a group of master performers, they can tell you for a fact exactly how these things are measured. They've figured it out, they've gained it, they make it happen so that they are master performers and they meet all of the expectations, all of the requirements, all of the measures for each and every one of their outputs. For each output and set of measures then, we can systematically derive and define the tasks. We can either have macro tasks, big major steps, or a bunch of micro tasks, uh, granular, you know, hit the enter key now and then turn to this other screen, you know, those kinds of things where there are more than one performer in the sandbox of performance in this area of performance we might articulate various roles and responsibilities there might be the manager there could be the supervisor there could be the individual contributor and there could be somebody else from some other organization involved in this cross functional process so we can use the four columns there that are in this chart or more columns as necessary or no columns if it's not needed if you're only looking at one job and we can articulate, well, who's doing what? Tasks one, two, and three, who's doing task one? Who's involved in it? Now, we can either put checks or X's in there to say, role two and four are involved in that first task, but nobody else. Or we can use other coding devices, and we'll get to that later on in this series of videos. Now, the first columns here that we've covered, the outputs, the tasks, and the roles and responsibilities, that articulates and captures the articulation of ideal performance as attested to, as consent, conceded to by the master performers assembled. That's the best. That's what people are doing, capable of doing. It's not blue sky. It's not some ideal state that's never been achieved. It's what the master performers agree that, yeah, those are the outputs. That's how you measure them. Uh, you can even put standards along with those measures if they have them. That gets to be a little bit more problematic and uh, guess, uh, you're guessing most of the time when you're doing that. And then most importantly, you can align the tasks, which the training will address later on. What tasks do you have to do in order to be able to produce those outputs? Those are your terminal performance objectives. Those are your terminal learning objectives. On the right hand side of this chart here, we have columns that identify typical performance gaps. Not atypical, once in a blue moon, but things that happen all of the time. What are they? And what we use to define those goes back to the measures. Now, for every one of the typical performance gaps, we're not getting outputs to measures, and I do this at that level versus doing it at the task level. I'm focused on the outputs of the process of process performance. And so we list those typical performance gaps, and for each one of those gaps, we can identify what is the probable gap cause. Now, the term, the phrase probable gap is kind of a weasel word, weasel phrase, because we're not going after root cause. In these 
meetings that I'm typically conducting with my analysis team, I don't have all the time in the world in order to focus on one particular gap and fi figure out what the root causes are and ask why five times or whatever the mechanism is for that root cause analysis. So off the tops of the heads as conceded to, it's important that this is a consensus, from the master performers assembled, they would tell me what causes that typical performance gap that relates back to the measures being missed for some of the outputs. And then later on, we can talk about for each one of those gap causes, is it, what kind of deficiency is it? Is it a deficiency of the environment and the environmental supports? I don't have the data or tools that I need, something like that. The saw is not sharp enough or something. Or is it a deficiency of the, this performer's group's knowledge and skills? They have a deficit there. Ah, training can fix that, knowledge management, job aids. They can fix those kinds of things by providing instruction and information to the performers before and or after or during the moment of need. Now, sometimes it could be that the deficiency is caused by individual attributes and values. There's physical attributes, psychological attributes, intellectual attributes, and personal values. Maybe my value system is contrary to what's required to do this performance. Perhaps I'm not physically strong enough to lift the 50-pound bags and load them into trucks all day long, and there's a physical requirement. Perhaps there's a need for me to be ambulatory and to be able to climb ladders and things like that, so I can't do that job if I'm in a wheelchair. But otherwise, we can systematically identify where we have physical requirements and where we don't. This is also used by me to help begin to educate the team of master performers handpicked by the project steering team as the analysis team to begin to understand what training can begin to address or learning can address and what it cannot. All the learning and training can do for the deficiencies of the environment and some of the other attributes and values kinds of things is to give a heads up to the performers, the learners, about typical things that they're going to find, what some of these causes are, and what they got to know or what they've got to kind of try to avoid, you know, missing information and data, missing tools, the saw not being sharp enough, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This allows me to also begin to elicit from this group of master performers what are their tricks of their trade, what are their best practices, how do they avoid these gaps in performance at the output level or the task level? What are their strategies and tactics? So while I may not be able to change the real world, which might be causing some of these performance gaps, we can find out and share in the learning, in the training, what the master performers do to avoid it in the first place, or if it's unavoidable, how do they handle it? I hope this video and this video series is helpful to you in your practice of performance-based training and development, learning and knowledge management. I've been practicing, publishing, and presenting on these topics since the early 1980s. My more recent book, Six Pack, covers all of this in great detail.